Hi everybody, this is Chris Morosky and this is a short video on preterm birth and prematurity. I'd like to thank Dr. Adam Borgita for his contributions to this video. The goals and objectives of this video are as follows. Discuss the burden of prematurity. Review the trends in Connecticut and national preterm birth data. Understand the risk factors and drivers of preterm birth. Describe the tests available to predict preterm birth. And review the use of progesterone to prevent recurrent preterm birth. Preterm birth or prematurity is the single most important cause of perinatal mortality in the United States. It is the leading cause of neonatal mortality, defined as death within the first 28 days of life in the United States. It is also the second leading cause of infant mortality, defined as death in the first year of life in the United States. Preterm birth is a major determinant of neonatal and infant illness. This would include neurodevelopmental handicaps such as cerebral palsy or mental retardation, chronic respiratory problems, intraventricular hemorrhage, periventricular leukomalacia, infection, retrolental fibroplasia, necrotizing enterocolitis, and neurosensory deficits such as hearing and visual. Prematurity generates enormous healthcare costs. The average newborn hospital charges for a term baby are $4,300 versus $58,000 for a preterm baby. The total U.S. hospital charges for infant stays due to prematurity and low birth weight are almost $12 billion. When you include maternity and related expenses, this is often the largest cost to employers' health care plans. As you can see, infant mortality, death in the first year of life, has decreased in the United States since 1915 to 2000. It's gone down from approximately 1 out of 10 to now 1 in 1,000 live births. There are multiple reasons for improved survival. One of these is NICU care. We now have ventilators, total parental nutrition, and surfactant. There's also improved obstetrical care. We now have steroids for lung maturity, latency antibiotics for preterm premature rupture of membranes, and we now have ultrasounds. If you look at selected leading causes of infant mortality in the United States and compare 1996 versus 2013, what you see is that birth defects are down 164 to 121 per 1,000 live births, but preterm birth and low birth weight is up 99 to 107 per 100,000 live births. SIDS is down, RDS is down, and importantly, maternal pregnancy complications are very much up, having gone from 32 to 40 per 100,000 live births. And specifically in Connecticut, looking at the leading causes of infant mortality to our most up-to-date data from 2013, you can see that Connecticut, when compared to the United States, is very much lower when it comes to birth defects, preterm birth, but is higher in SIDS and is about even with maternal pregnancy complications. Preterm delivery in Connecticut compared to the rest of the United States from 2007 to 2016 shows that overall our state is slightly lower than the national average. However, you can see that both Connecticut and the nation have approximately 9 to 10% of live births that are preterm. And when broken down by race and ethnicity, you can see that Asian and Pacific Islanders, on average, from 2013 to 2015 across the nation, had an 8.5% preterm birth rate. White ethnicity had 8.9%. Hispanic ethnicity or race was 9.1%. American Indian and Alaska Native was 10.5%. And black women had a 13.3% preterm birth rate. What this shows is that in the United States, the preterm birth rate among black women is 49% higher than the rate among all other women. There are various different types of preterm birth. There is spontaneous preterm birth, which is the spontaneous onset of labor and contractions, which lead to delivery of the infant. There's preterm premature rupture of membranes, where the water breaks prior to the onset of labor. And then there's medical intervention, or what we call indicated preterm birth. And while this suggests distinct pathways, many of the risk factors for all three are similar. What you can see is that over time, there's been changes in the etiology of preterm birth. These graphs look at preterm birth from 1989 to 2001. Looking at the graph on the left, you can see that for the most part, all preterm births, rupture membranes, medically indicated, and spontaneous preterm births seem to be changing slightly. When you superimpose them on themselves in the right graph, what you can see is that the medically indicated preterm births have greatly gone up over that time period, while all preterm births, spontaneous preterm births, and ruptured membranes causing preterm birth have either stayed the same or slightly gone down. What this suggests is that there may be some changes in the health of our mothers over that period of time. 
Looking at some of the risk factors for preterm birth, a previous preterm birth presents a probability of 30% of preterm birth of a subsequent pregnancy. Greater than two previous preterm births increases this to 70%. Twin gestations has a probability of preterm birth of 50%, and triplets are higher, this approaches 75 to 95%. Uterine malformations, such as a unicorn or uterus, increase the probability of preterm birth to 30%. Looking at maternal age for a risk factor for preterm birth, in the United States from 2013 to 2015, you can see that for the age groups of less than 20, 20 to 29, and 30 to 39, the percentage of preterm births was pretty much steady around 9 to 10%. However, looking at women over 40 years old, this increased greatly to 14.3%. Looking more closely at multiple gestations in preterm birth in the Connecticut in the United States, you can see that singleton pregnancies have a preterm birth rate of 7.8% as compared to 60.3% for multiple gestations. In this time period of 2015, you can see that multiple gestations accounted for 3.5% of the live births in the United States and 4.1% of the live births in Connecticut. Tobacco smoking is also a risk factor for preterm birth. There are some very interesting trends for Connecticut and the United States from 2006 to 2017. What we can see is that overall, the percentage of women smoking during pregnancy has decreased over time, and also that Connecticut has had a lower percentage of women smoking during pregnancy compared to the nation. Also, looking at BMI and its association with preterm birth, it can be seen that a low BMI is associated with an increased risk for spontaneous preterm birth. Looking at a BMI less than 19, the percentage of spontaneous preterm birth is 16.6%. You can see this drop to 11.3% for a BMI of 19 to 24.9, 8.1% for normal BMI of 25 to 29.9, 7.1% for obesity at 30 to 34.9, and down to 5.2 for a BMI over 35. Going with this, Indicated preterm birth is about the same, but does seem to be slightly higher for the BMI of 30 to 34.9. For a long period of time, there were no tests available to predict premature birth. There are now two recent advances in predicting premature birth. These are fetal fibronectin and cervical length measurement. We will look at them separately. First, fetal fibronectin. Fetal fibronectin is a intracellular matrix of the cervix. It can be found in between the chorion and the decidua, as shown in the picture. It is secreted with cervical changes, and if absent from the vagina, there is a very low risk for preterm birth. FFN is low from 24 to 34 weeks gestational age. It is helpful for symptomatic patients, therefore, that are greater than 24 weeks in gestation. The value of the FFN really is in its negative predictive value. If an FFN is negative, there is a 98% chance that the patient will not deliver in the next two weeks, and therefore there is no need to spend additional money or resources on that patient. Unfortunately, the positive predictive value is not as helpful, and when the test is positive, there is a 50% chance that the patient will deliver in the next two weeks. Looking at a graph of FFN at 24 weeks and the risk for preterm birth, it is important to keep in mind that the cutoff for the FFN being positive or negative is important in terms of how well it performs in predicting preterm birth. With the black line, the cutoff for FFN is zero. With the red line, the cutoff for FFN is one to 50. With the blue line, the cutoff is 50 to 200 and the green line is greater than 200. So certainly, as the concentration of your cutoff for FFN increases, it is more predictive of the risk for preterm birth, and that women who have such high cutoffs, such as the green line, certainly are at risk for preterm birth. In a Cochrane review of studies evaluating the use of fetal fibronectin testing for reducing the risk of preterm birth, what they found was in the top graph that using FFN did reduce the risk of preterm birth less than 37 weeks. However, in reducing the risk of preterm birth less than 32 weeks, FFN was not successful. This can be seen in the bottom graph. And the use of FFN did not improve the gestational age at delivery in this Cochrane review. Now moving on to cervical length measurement. In a study published by J. Imes in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1996, they correlated the length of the cervix with the risk of preterm birth. And you can see that the mean cervical length was 3.5 centimeters, and that the risk factor for preterm birth was approximately 2 to 3% when the cervix was this long. 
As the service gradually became shorter and shorter and shorter, or moving to the left side of the graph, the relative risk for preterm birth increased greatly. In fact, for a woman with a cervical length of 1.2 centimeters, the relative risk for preterm birth was over 14. This led to recommendations to screen women with a cervical length measurement using a transvaginal ultrasound to predict the risk of preterm birth. While this may not be applied generally across all populations, certainly all women who have risk factors for preterm birth are recommended to undergo cervical length screening. What that looks like in an ultrasound is shown in this picture. In this first picture, the vaginal ultrasound probe is pressed too far into the vagina and compresses the cervix. You can see the cervix in the middle of the screen as the grayish mass in the middle of the ultrasound screen with the white line running through it representing the endocervical canal. As the vaginal probe is pulled out slightly from the vagina, you can begin to see some of the amniotic fluid near the internal os showing up as a black triangle. With some pressure on the fundus of the uterus being transmitted through the pregnancy down to the cervix, you can see now a black funneling of the inner portion of the cervix. The cervical length is then measured as the white line of the part of the cervix that is closed, and this is called the functional length of the cervix. In this image, the cervical length is 2.6 centimeters, and this is slightly shortened. We will end this video by discussing progesterone for the prevention of preterm birth. There is recent evidence to suggest that progesterone maintains uterine quiescence. Progesterone inhibits the production of prostaglandins. It also inhibits the production of contraction-associated protein genes, such as oxytocin and prostaglandin receptors, gap junctions, and ion channels. It downregulates the production of calcium channels, and it therefore decreases uterine contractions. Looking at some of the historical studies on the use of progesterone for the prevention of recurrent preterm birth, this goes back to the 1970s when Papernick and colleagues published a placebo-controlled trial of 99 women in the third trimester who were given 17-alpha-hydroxy progesterone caparate, and they found that this was efficacious for preventing preterm birth. In 1975, Johnson et al. published in the New England Journal of Medicine that initiating 17-hydroxy progesterone in the second trimester prevented preterm birth. In 1980, there was a study that showed that this was not efficacious for preventing preterm birth in twins, and in 1989, meta-analysis said that this was still unclear. More recent studies were published in 2003, and the paper shown here by Mies et al. is one of the landmark studies around progesterone for the prevention of preterm birth. This was run out of the National Institutes of Child and Health Development and the Maternal Fetal Medicine University, and this was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial. Women were enrolled at 16 to 20 weeks and were either given placebo or 250 milligrams of 17-hydroxy progesterone all through weekly injections and the primary outcome for the study was spontaneous preterm birth less than 37 weeks. 2,980 women were eligible for the study, 1,039 met entry criteria, and 463 consented for the trial. And cutting to the chase, delivery before 37 weeks was greatly reduced by the use of progesterone by a total of 34%. Delivery before 35 weeks gestational age was reduced by 33%, and delivery before 32 weeks gestational age was decreased by 42%. All of these results were statistically significant. In a separate study by Dave Fonseca et al., this was also published in 2003, they looked at the use of vaginal progesterone in a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study out of Brazil. They looked at 142 high-risk singleton pregnancies and these patients were either given 100 milligrams of vaginal progesterone or placebo daily. The vaginal suppositories contained 100 milligrams of natural progesterone, and it was applied nightly from 24 to 34 weeks. What they found was that there was, again, a decreased risk of preterm birth less than 37 weeks in the progesterone group, 28.5% for placebo, 13.8% for progesterone, there was also a decreased incidence of preterm birth less than 34 weeks, 18.6% for placebo, and 2.8% for progesterone, and these were significantly different. Looking at the cumulative deliveries, you can see that the progesterone group had more undelivered patients compared to the placebo group. This again was statistically significant. In brief summary of progesterone, 
it appears that randomized studies show benefit to using 17-hydroxyprogesterone and vaginal progesterone in patients with a short cervix or with a history of preterm birth. Randomized studies so far show no benefit in using progesterone for patients with twins, triplets, or if a stitch called a cerclage is placed in the cervix. So importantly, what we can do as providers in decreasing preterm birth is to recommend our patients to stop smoking, improve their BMI and nutrition, and take a good history of spontaneous preterm birth and find women with short cervixes and offer them progesterone. The take-home messages here are that all women are at risk for preterm labor and birth. The rate of preterm labor and birth is rising mostly due to indicated preterm births. We know now that 70-hydroxyprogesterone and vaginal progesterone may be beneficial in certain populations, and really everybody should just stop smoking. So wrapping it up, I think we did meet our goals and objectives. They were to discuss the burden of prematurity, review the trends in Connecticut and national preterm birth data, understand the risk factors and drivers of preterm birth, describe the tests available to predict preterm birth, and review the use of progesterone to prevent recurrent preterm birth. Thank you for watching this video. We hope you found it helpful. Good luck with your studies, and we'll be seeing you soon in class. Take care. Music